time for another episode of Animal Music. This week, we are talking about reptiles. With me, your host, Animal, and Professor, Dr. David Bashwater. So, first question that you all might be asking right now is, what is a reptile? Um, we'll talk about the family tree, um, some current day reptiles, like the one in the upper right, and our relationship to reptiles. We'll talk about, about some reptilian innovations, what made them um, <clears throat> different from their sort of amphibian-like and fish-like ancestors, and um, yes, anyway, able to take over the land. And one of those main things was developing an amniotic sac, basically having eggs um, that wouldn't dry out in the in the air instead of in the water. Um, and they develop different types of body shapes and different types of movement. And then we'll look at vocalizations, and of course we'll talk about how the sounds are produced a little bit, and then how those sounds function. And then a brief conclusion of a question and answer session. So let's start with this question, what is a reptile? There you can see someone studying up on this himself or herself. Um, where do reptiles come from? Well, reptiles are one of the three main groups of amniotes. We can see this tree, which we had from last week when we were talking about amphibians, I've just adapted it. So instead of branching to the left and talking about all the amphibian groups, we are talking about the amniote groups. Um, and among the amniotes, there are reptiles, of course, and also mammals and birds. And you can see mammals branch off from reptiles a bit earlier than birds. And we're going to see the birds are actually kind of reptiles, depending on how we define reptile. So amniotes are the group of tetrapods that are not amphibians. So tetrapods would be the lobe fin fish right there. Their fins develop into lobes that can allow them to sort of like walk up a little bit on land. So they become tetrapods, you could say, around, I mean, somewhere around here. Um, and so amphibians and then all the amniotes, those are the tetrapods. And then birds, of course, have two wings and two feet, but we still call them tetrapods. With us, we have hands and feet, but we're still tetrapods. Pod means foot. So tetrapods evolved from lobed fin, <laughs> lobe finned fish, uh, whose fins were quote unquote made for walking, like these boots are made for walking. Um, somewhat, you know, like the, they basically just allow them to move around a bit more than they would if they yeah, we're just plain old fins. Um, and, you know, I have been trying to figure out to what extent the lobe-finned fish all had primitive lungs. There are lung fish, and the lung fish are members of the group of lobe-finned fish. Um, and then, of course, amphibians and all the amniotes, we have lungs. And apparently, um, the dividing line between having a lung and not having a lung is not a super um, hard and fast one. But as far as I can tell, the lobe-finned fish... Uh, they at least overlap with the development of lungs. Um, and then finally, if we're going backward on the family tree, um, the lobe finned fish were a subgroup of the bony fish. And the bony fish are just all the lobe finned fish, which is all the tetrapods, right? But also all the ray fin fish. And those are the things that we mostly call fish today. But you would also include the cartilaginous fish, right? Sharks, rays, and something else. Um, those would be included in fish fish. So those are the jawed vertebrates. And then you have the two remaining types of vertebrates that don't have jaws, which are the lampreys and the hagfish. Um, and then, uh, you know, you keep going back, but this is, this is a good family tree for our presentation today. Um, but let's look in a little bit more depth at the whole amniote thing. So if you look at the bottom, we have amniotes, then amniotes divides into a couple of things that keep dividing and at the top. On the left, you get birds, dinosaurs, and then a bunch of different types of reptiles, and then mammals. And I have reptiles in quotes. Hmm, interesting. So the term reptile is not precise in the cladistic sense. So I know you're wondering what cladistic means. Cladistics is the science of taxonomy according to ancestry. Right, rather than superficial characteristics. So I was thinking of an example of this. Bats and birds both have wings. Um, 
And if you're ever at the Bosque at night, you can see, uh, you often see like bats swooping around over your head, or they could be birds. If it's at dusk or even darker, it is hard to tell whether it's a bat or a bird that's flying over your head. You might think that bats are therefore closely related to birds, and you might not even think about rel relatedness in terms of ancestry. You might think, well, just because they all have wings, let's group them together as things that have wings. But, um... It, the way modern taxonomy works is you're trying to figure out where animals came from, how they evolved. So basing things on superficial characteristics, like having wings, doesn't really work. So as you know, when you were growing up, you would group bats with other mammals because it says even though they have wings, they also have hair, they give birth to live young, um, they're warm-blooded. Birds are warm-blooded too, but that's different. Um, so, but... Even those things are superficial characteristics. Ultimately, um, those give you hints about ancestry, but it takes a lot of work to figure out what the whole family tree is. And scientists, you know, argue about this. They sometimes, you know, there's a question about where the turtles really branch off here and eh, some other things like that. So the clade sauropsids includes all reptiles, as you can see here. So amniotes, synapsids become mammals. The sauropsids include all these things, and these are reptiles and birds. But notice this is uh, there's a complex branching here. If we tried to say just reptiles, we don't have a real clade. So if we said, okay, reptiles equals sauropsids, we'd have reptiles, all the reptiles and dinosaurs and birds. But check this out, the clade archosaurs, this thing, um, includes not only crocodiles, crocodilians, um, that includes like alligators and caimans and stuff like that, uh, crocodilians and dinosaurs, which we think of as reptiles, right? But also birds. Um, so since archosaurs includes that, right, um, you basically can't separate birds off as a separate thing from reptiles based on this, the cladistics. Crocodiles are more closely related to birds than they are to other reptiles. Therefore, if crocodiles are to be included in the group of reptiles, so should birds and dinosaurs. Um, so, but even though this is tricky in terms of cladistics uh, and not exactly correct, all scientists seem still to do this, which is that we use the term reptile in the traditional sense to mean crocodiles, turtles, tuataras, lizards, and snakes. And the important thing for us in this is we just need to remember when we are looking at birds next, we have to remember that birds are a specific type of reptile. They have evolved. Um, if there are certain characteristics that all sauropsids have that we see in all these animals or that all archosaurs have, you know, that we would see in crocodiles, maybe dinosaurs, um, we're going to assume that birds had that and then continue to develop additional things from that. Okay. So that's the important point here. Um, uh, let's take a look at some spinal, I guess basically just these are just like skeletons. These are um, stages of evolution between fish type things that you have at the bottom there and amphibian reptile type things that you have toward the top. So let's look in order from bottom to top. So at the bottom we have Eusthenopteron. So all these animals, I believe, are extinct. But these are, um, yeah, fossil finds that we have used to reconstruct um, evolution. So the history of reptiles, basically. And the history, this includes history of amphibians. Okay, Eusthenopteron. So 385 million years ago, um, we read a little bit about Tiktaalik that we'll see in the next, you know, next slot up, and that's around 375 million years ago. So this is a little bit before that. Um, it was a lobe fin fish, so I, I believe that may mean that it already had some lungs, and it, or you can see the little lobe things. You can see the little foot, like you know, those are like little foot hand things in the fins. Actually, I'm not sure about those versus those, but whatever. Um, you have hands and feet ish type things. Okay, then you get Tiktaalik. We read about Tiktaalik, 
Uh, it was a tetrapod-like lobe finned fish with a flat head like a crocodile. So you can see this fish's head is a little bit more round still, and this one starts to be flat. So that's something that uh, land animals are going to have. Acanthostega from 365 million years ago um, had some recognizable limbs. So if we looked at Tiktaalik, the actual living organism, we would it would look like it had fins, even if they were lobe finned. Um, if they were lobey, fleshy. Um, with Acanthostega, we would be able to see limbs, but it was still living mostly in the water. And then Ichthyostega is from around the same time, 365 million years ago. It had stronger hips and shoulders, um, more supportive ribs, um, and stronger vertebrae generally. And then it was using its forelimbs for locomotion on land and its tail for swimming. So that's kind of interesting. It's got these two different ways of moving. Um, it's, it's got its front limbs for moving on land, for pulling it along, basically. These animals are all probably st mostly dragging themselves along the ground, like reptiles do, um, and like snakes do, obviously. Uh, but then it was still swimming, so it had a big, powerful tail. And um, the fact that animals are are moving on land when they're in the water they're buoyant right they're basically the same density as the water so i mean they float which is kind of obvious but uh when they're on land they have to have stronger bodies to be able to do that so when we're when you're seeing that they have stronger hips and shoulders um stronger vertebrae more supportive ribs all those things are adaptations for land okay then you get tip temno spondyli uh from 330 million years ago which was semi-aquatic or fully terrestrial. I mean, there are a bunch of different species of them, I believe. So uh, some of them were semi-aquatic, some of them fully terrestrial. They were crocodile-like ancestors. And then, but they're still from the time period uh, where there's not yet a split, really, between amphibians and reptiles. And then from around the same time period, Lepospondyli, um which is a possible common ancestor for amphibians and reptiles. So same exact time period. Um, and you can see that there's two different versions of that. I actually don't know that much about that, but one of them looks much more reptile or amphibian-like, and one of them looks much more snake-like. Um, okay, so I'm just going to take us back, actually, to a couple of the... Uh, so if we looked at this chart again, we're basically looking at the time period in here from lobe fin fish to a common ancestor of amphibians and reptiles. And then amphibians, you know, we get frogs and Sicilians and uh, whatever that gym. Uh, oh, salamanders and newts. Um, not so, anyway, whatever. Uh, so, um, you get those guys, and the salamanders and newts really do look very reptilian to us. So it isn't that crazy to think that um, you know, that they would that, that what we were just looking at would be a shared ancestor. They don't look like frogs, but frogs are actually pretty evident derived body shape. Okay, so that gives us a sense of where reptiles were coming from. So this is our last screen, I promise, on what is a reptile. Um, if you already knew what a reptile was, I apologize, but hopefully you're enjoying this anyway. Um, so the earliest things that look like reptiles, uh, oh, these are out of order, aren't they? Let's just see here. Um, so the earliest amniotes we were just looking at around 340, we said 330 on the previous slide, but, um, sometime around then. Um, these were reptile-like amphibians or amphibian-like reptiles. There's not; they haven't really diverged much at this point. Um, and these, so these are therefore the shared ancestors of synapsids and sauropsids. And the synapsids um, are the ones that become mammals, and the sauropsids are the ones that become reptiles and birds and dinosaurs. So, an example organism from around this time period is in the upper right corner, Cassinaria which had clawed fingers and toes. So we've seen limb or we've seen fins become more lobey and then have fingers and toes. We get that around right now. So looking much more like what we have today. 
Um, and you can see this thing looks like a lizard. So this Cassinaria is an ancestor to reptiles and amphibians, right? Or, you know, representative of it. And but it's also ancestor to us. So all mammals, you know, we had grandparents that looked, you know, great, 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 etc. Grandparents that looked like this Cassinaria. So, and then the earliest reptile, reptile things, um, you, around 312 million years ago, you get that with Hylonimus, um in the lower right corner. So it was the common ancestor of all reptiles and birds. So it was a sauropsid. Um, and uh, you can still see it resembles a small lizard. Reptiles, and then diapsids is just a... Anyway, it's it, diapsids is the same thing as sauropsids, but it just like excludes a couple of the extinct species. But we can basically think of those as the same. Reptiles, diapsids diverge into lepidosaurs and archosaurs. So you're wondering, what are those things? We did see them on the previous screen. Lepidosaurs are the lizards, snakes, and tuataras. There's only two species of tuataras, but we, we do talk about them just briefly today. But I'm sure you know what lizards and snakes are. So you're seeing divergence between the lepidosaurs um, and the archosaurs, which are going to be birds and crocodiles and uh, dinosaurs. So um, at around 250 million years ago. So they have a more sprawling, they have a sprawling gait, right? Lizard, lizardy. You can see the guy at the bottom there. He's definitely, his body's kind of flat on the ground and his arms and legs are out to the side. And then the archosaurs um, are the crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. And, um, wait, yeah, no, birds are reptiles. So they have a parasagittal gait, which just means um, their legs are less out to the sides and they're not as much dragging their body on the ground. Um, their legs are more underneath them. And that's something that you end up seeing with mammals as well. Um, and crocodiles normally... They have the sprawling gait, but they have this like standing upright walk that they do, um, which you'll see on the next screen. Oh, two screens from now. I mean, one screen from now. Um, okay, so let's talk about some innovations that reptiles had because they ended up taking over the land in a sense. Um, it was new that they didn't have to live in the water or near the water. Um, so how did they do it? Um, first of all, they developed a new kind of of egg or like some new innovations in the egg so you can see this happens to be a chicken egg which is and we can include this as a reptile um but if you look at a human fetus inside the womb there's a lot, the, a lot of these things are very similar so there's the embryo um yeah i think this is the same thing is called the um the yolk the vitellus not sure about that um then there's some other things in there there's blood vessels um, the amnion is some fluid there, then there's like the, you know, amniotic membrane, I think, which is there, any event, and then there's some space in there, there's some air, and then there's an outer shell. So, um, this new, I mean, it's like fancy packaging. When you think about, yeah, okay. So, um, it's a, they develop, you know, reptiles of various sorts develop a sturdy but porous leathery or hard eggshell so turtles tend to have leathery type eggs um, and then we know chicken eggs are kind of a hard thing um the egg can breathe it actually has some respiration going on through the egg um and it doesn't lose the moisture and that's because of the sac the double amniotic sac um eggs can be laid on land without drying out and therefore there's no need to return to water for breeding so i imagine reptiles still need to drink water but they basically can go colonize parts of the land they wouldn't be able to colonize otherwise if they were amphibians so um the uh in Fish, there are plenty of species of fish and frog. I mean, there are some where internal fertilization is what happens, right? Um, but in most cases, it's not internal fertilization. It's external, meaning the female drops the eggs and then the male puts sperm on top of them once they're outside of the female's body. But when you have internal fertilization, I hadn't thought about this way until I was preparing this presentation, but the female ends up having more control over the breeding situation. She knows that she's the mother of those particular eggs. Um, she carries them around in her 
um, she might be more, she might have more control over who she breeds with. So that's an interesting way of thinking about that. And then there's no larval stage. Remember, like larva means larva is a juvenile form of an organism that's distinct from the adult. So when you have a tadpole, that's a very different type of organism from a frog. It has to go through a metamorphosis. So the tadpole stage is the larval stage. Reptiles don't have that anymore. They're born once they get out of the womb. Oh, sorry, not out of the womb. Once they get out of the egg, they're in the adultish form already. Um, so that is new for them. And remember that tadpoles really did require water. They were like, you know, fish-like things in their early life. So they really did have to live in the water. Um, and then their body shape and quality of movement does change and develop. And that's something we do look at on the next screen. They have sprawling gait um, at first. And then they there's a S-type movement. If you, um, yeah, we could do this. Uh, yeah. So right now, if you... <laughs> Do this with me. I'm doing like uh, a slow S shape with my body. Um, so this is the way you would swim in water, right? And then if you're a reptile walking on land, you can't see my feet, but uh, let's see. You walk like this. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's enough of that. Um, so that type of movement, and we're going to see that, that that changes a bit. So if this is a fully sprawling gait, then when you're parasagittal, when you're more erect, you're like this. And when you're fully um, standing, you know, with the legs upright, um, that there's different. You carry the weight in a different way. This way versus like this versus like this. Right? It's like different stages of a push-up. Um, and that does influence movement. And then something that is very cool, uh, is that um, if you look at fish swimming versus mammals swimming, so let's say, say like a whale or a dolphin swimming versus a fish swimming, fish always swimming side to side like this. I mean, maybe it's like this, but whatever. Um, they're, the way their spine works, whereas mammals swim like this. So something developed in mammalian evolution where they were able to move their bodies this way in, in ways that fish don't do it. Um, and we're going to learn about one of those in a second, which has to do with the breathing apparatus. So there's something called carrier's constraint. Um, carrier's constraint is, is that air-breathing vertebrates with two lungs that flex their bodies sideways to locomote that's what I was showing you basically before, the S-shaped movement, have difficulty moving and breathing at the same time. And then this little image is from Streeter and Northcutt. And um, yeah, their book is amazing. It's on the evolution of, of brains. Brains through time is what it's called. So um, you can see with this lizard on the left, um, it's... It, uh, um, it, uh, it's arching its body to the right, right? The lizard on the left is arching its body to the right. That's squishing the lung on the left, and it's opening the lung on the right. And that is making the air go from the left-hand lung directly to the right lung. It's not making the, the air go in and out of the mouth. Instead, it's just being exchanged between the lungs. And then as the lizard goes to the other side again, just the air goes from the right lung back to the left lung. So this is not what you want if you're trying to breathe. Um, air moves from one lung to the other rather than in and out. Ideally, you want the air to go into both lungs at the same time and out both lungs at the same time. As a result, lizards move in short bursts with long pauses to breathe. So they basically can't run and breathe at the same time. So let's say this is your problem, and you might wonder why why mammals don't have this problem. Why can we run and breathe at the same time? Like marathon runners obviously breathe at least once when they're running, because um, we have a diaphragm. So the diaphragm uh, trumps our rib movement. The diaphragm pulls down and brings in air pressure to both lungs at the same time. 
um, and then it pushes them back up. So, but uh, reptiles have not evolved that. So, what are some solutions you can have? You can have a single lung. So in snakes, there's only one lung, so that doesn't it doesn't go back and forth between two lungs. You can stand up and run on your hind legs. That way you're not doing the S-type movement. And I can't remember the names of the lizards that do that, but there are some lizards that do it. Um, and then for crocodiles, you have the high walk thing, which is um, more erect. And they do that, I think they, I mean, I don't actually know when they do it, but uh, that has something to do about making it easier for them to run and breathe at the same time, I believe. Um, this is also from Streeter and Northcutt at the top there, tetrapod stances, so the sprawling stance, the semi-erect stance, and then the erect stance. Uh, and then in mammals, as I was showing you just a moment ago, the way mammals swim, like our S, <laughs> the S is not side to side for us, it's front back. So we end up having... If you flex your spine forward and backward instead of from side to side, you don't have the issue of the air going from one lung to the other. It'd be the same as having a single lung or having a diaphragm. Here's a little poem uh, by Richard Cohen. Uh, the reptilian idea of fun is to bask all day in the sun. A physiological barrier discovered by Carrier says they can't breathe if they run. So let's now talk about vocalizing in cold blood if you are a reptile. Um, we'll do turtles first. So one third of species of turtles vocalize during courtship. So they take all, that doesn't mean that they all do, but a third of them, that's a lot. So um, most species, uh, sorry, the most vocal species of turtle are various tortoises, soft-shell turtles, pond turtles, and batagorid turtles. I do not know my way around the turtles, so I don't know. Anyway, if you don't either, then that's okay. If you do, awesome. Um, so if we look at tortoises specifically, um, most of the calling is done by males, and that's done in courtship and during mounting. Um, the sounds can range from being noisy-type sounds, like shh, or tonal. <laughs> um, frequency tends to be between 100 hertz, which is like a low G on the bass clef, and 700 hertz, which I'm thinking is basically top of the, yeah, top of the treble clef. So there. Um, the duration of each vocalization could be between 80 milliseconds, which is less than a tenth of a second, and a thousand milliseconds, which is a second. And then the intercall interval could be as small as a third of a second or as long as three seconds. Um, and then there's some interesting things here, because you might say, like, well, what 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 do those different things mean? We know we have all those different types of sounds um in music, but uh yeah, what does it mean for an animal? So um, the size of the body in the different species or in different individuals does correlate with the frequency height. So, you know, you take a piccolo and you take a double bass, the size of the instrument definitely correlates with the frequency range of the instrument, and that's going to be the same thing with tortoises. And then on um, the duration... Uh, duration of the sounds, and then the inter the duration of the spacing between the sounds is correlated with how much, how likely they were to mount, to breed. So, um, it, it, so it just tells you that those things do matter to listeners. Um, and then, uh, you know, I tried to find, some, I mean, I found in, uh, written information, but I couldn't find any sounds. But um, there is a turtle, the... Travancore tortoise, um, which does some nocturnal chorusing in groups. But unfortunately, I couldn't find any video of that. I will show you a video of turtles making sounds in just a moment. So then we have tur turtles, um, and there is a freshwater northern snake necked turtle that has 17 different types of call. I couldn't find a video of this, but I, mean, I can find video of this turtle, but not making its calls. Um, but in any event, some of those calls are harmonic series 
with frequency modulation. So that just means it's going to be a tonal sound that has harmonics, but then frequency modulation means it's either going ah or ah, or it could be ah, 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 ah. we don't know. Um, it can make noisy calls like um, clicks uh, in isolation or in trains. And then there's even transitions between these, and that's probably how it gets all the 17 different varieties. And there's an Aura turtle, Aura turtle, and the females have six different types of call. I also could not find examples of this, but I hope to in the future. Um, and then in this species, the juveniles, um, you know, young turtles, vocalize from inside the egg, and we'll see a video of that. Uh, they vocalize in the nest, in the water, and then they elicit... In doing that, they're not just, you know, expressing themselves. They elicit a response from the mother, and then the mother has the six types of call. So that there is presumably some very interesting mother-infant communication in those turtles. Um, let us take a look at a brief clip of a video of turtles making noises. All right. I wouldn't say this is the highest quality video, uh, the highest quality video on the market because it's called, it's by company called rib ticklers but still it does have turtles making sense let's give a listen don't be mad Okay, I'm also going to show you a, um, a quick page from Lang Elliot. So I haven't yet done that much investigation of him, but I do, I have um, yeah, heard from scientific papers that he does some of the best capturing of um, audio recordings of animals across the animal kingdom. But certainly he does a lot with frogs, and I found a recording, uh, you know, an album of his of bird song on Spotify. So Lang Elliot, um, that's not him, this is more likely him. Um, but that's his name there. Anyway, here, this is a snapping turtle that he got a recording of. That hissing is him, and then this is him. So one thing you can do is you can listen to his breathing. So probably the hissing on the is in the inhale, and this is on the exhale, but the exhale is very long. I mean, it sounds like he's producing multiphonics, right? So we're probably in the middle of a hiss-like thing. And then... See, there's a sm pulsing within it. And then there's a 
there's upper harmonics for these things, and we could look at what the, where the fundamental frequency is. It's around 500 hertz. So if it's 500, there should be a 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, etc. And that is what we get. 500. Hmm, a little bit less than 1,000. But if those are harmonics, that's how it should work. Okay. Now let's take a look at lizards. Um, so, and now that I've said that, Twatara is not a lizard, but I needed to put it somewhere. So, um, we just looked at turtles, um, and then, anyway, we're looking at squamates. Squamates include snakes, lizards, and the Twatara, um, so, and we'll look at lizards in a second, but we'll just start with the Twatara. Um, if you look at it, it looks kind of like a lizard, but it's, it's a much more ancient representative of what lizards and snakes would have been like. So I just found some things interesting about this. In terms of vocalization, it, it only grunts. But the sex of the offspring in the Twatara are determined by the temperature at which the eggs are kept. So sort of building on our um, discussion from the past weeks about how sex and gender um, interact with vocalization and, and behaviors in animals. Um, this is, and, and also going along with that, um, the podcast or the pair of podcasts that you listen to about how the X and Y chromosome work in humans. And um, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the idea that like, even if you are a male, you have a female you inside you, um, that just a light switch type thing did or didn't turn on and vice versa. Um, so anyway, it, this is just an example of that. It's pretty fascinating that it isn't even in the genes itself. It's in just the temperature at which the eggs are laid or kept. Um, and then they do have some grunts that they produce. I couldn't get recordings, but they are used in courtship and feeding and aggressive displays. So then we get to lizards, and the geckos are by far the most vocal of all the lizards, and we'll watch a video in just a moment. Um, and um, yeah, the geckos also have, so they have complex vocalizations, and then the vocalizations are also flexible. So I was just reading an article. There's something called the Lombard effect that birds and mammals have, which is if it, you're in a noisy environment, if you produce louder sounds. And apparently the geckos don't do that, but they have different types of sounds that they produce, and some of them are louder than others. And when they're in the noisy environment, they produce a greater number of the louder sounds. So. They're doing something like that, and their vocalizations are therefore flexible. They have complex calls with harmonic structure, so that means overtones. Um, they have an elaborate vocal apparatus with elastic vocal cords, um, and their calls are used in territorial behavior and courtship behavior. And then both sexes of adults vocalize and also the juveniles. So all of the geckos are vocalizing. Um, from all ages, I would say. And then um, you have the Australian pigopod lizards, um, which are like legless lizards. So they look like snakes. Um, they produce clicks or so fast that they actually sound like tones, so 8,000 times a second. I could not get a recording of that, unfortunately. Um, but I wanted to bring this up in particular because you might think, like, if it's a legless lizard, why not just call it a snake? Right? So this goes back to our concept of what make, what's a superficial characteristic and a deep level one. So um, they're not snakes. They didn't diverge back there. They came along with everybody else. And then they're one of the lizards. And then they later lost their legs. And they have other things, other qualities that make them similar to lizards, which helps you recognize that, they're, that their ancestry is part of in there with lizards, not with snakes. Um, okay, let's take a look at this gecko video.
Okay, now let's look at snakes. Uh, so, most interestingly, the snake larynx, larynx has no vocal cords. Um, the, it produces sounds by rubbing scales or rattling its tail, as in rattlesnakes, or hissing. And hissing is really important because um, hissing is going to be found in, in all the reptiles. Um, and it's always a defensive, aggressive sort of tactic. I mean, defensive and aggressive are opposites, but basically a, a defending itself um, or fighting. So uh, how does it hiss? It inflates its lungs, or in the case of a snake, I guess lung, if there's only one lung, um, and emits an airstream that could be continuous or intermittent or explosive. So continuous would be <laughs> intermittent would presumably be <laughs> and explosive would be <laughs> Oh, that sounds like just like a sneeze. Sorry if that hurt your ears. So somewhere between, I mean, it's broadband noise, but it's between 3 and 13 kilohertz. And But we will see in just a moment that um, that the uh, king cobra produces it at around, at a lower frequency of around 600 hertz. So um, you find it together with warning display behaviors, as we'll see in a video of the king cobra. And the hiss is around 600 kilohertz, or 600 hertz. That's, that's lower. Um, that's like our... Uh, it's about um, a, a upper, upper part of the treble clef. Um, okay, and then hissing is always defensive, and it's also found in lizards, turtles, and crocodiles. So snakes, lizards, turtles, crocodiles. I guess the Tuatara don't do it, but um, I don't know that they don't. It just didn't say it in the thing I was reading. So let's take a look at the king cobra. ตัวยังไงเลยโอ้ยเยสเยสเยสโอ้ยโอ้น่ากลัวจริงๆเฮ้ยเฮ้ยโอ้ยเสียงดีมากเสียงดีมากเนาะเห็นได้เนาะ <laughs> <laughs> So you can see he was kind of tuned it. Like if you had to find a pitch that would probably be around 600 hertz. That's the point. Uh, okay, so now crocodiles. Mm -hmm. And crocodiles really have the most complex vocal displays, I think, of all the quote unquote reptiles other than birds. So they produce a bellow and you'll watch a video about that, but it's pretty awesome. Um, it's produced by both sexes during courtship and defense, not detense. Um, and the American alligator apparently of all the crocodilians has the most uh, complex rep repertoire. So its dominant frequency is around 125 to 250 Hertz. So that's going to be middle or like, yeah, I guess throughout the bass clef, basically, and a little bit higher. So you have a because a 440, a220 is the a at the top of the bass clef. So that takes us to almost up to 250. So maybe up to middle C. All right. Um, so dominant frequency in there. But then the thing that you're going to see in the video is, is it couples with the water pr to produce a lower sound. We can't even hear it. Um, the one that they're doing in the video is at 19 hertz. Um, and the crocodiles are, or they're, it's in caimans, but the caimans are able to hear that. Um, okay. So uh, it, anyway, it's very cool. Um, so they hiss also. Um, they hissed for nest defense, and I guess that's the females that are defending the nests um, when they're having territorial interaction. And I believe that would be for breeding and not nests, but I don't really know. Um, the males are going to hiss. Uh, so it's always used for, um, you know, being defensive or territorial. Uh, it's So the bellow is very loud. The hissing is quieter. Um, but it's longer in duration. So that's one of the things, I mean, you'll see it in all animals, but specifically, I guess you don't see it with the midshipmen. Um, and you don't, let me see it with frogs. Um, there's a certain amount of air, yeah, that they have. So there's a trade-off between making a short, loud sound, a short sound that produces a lot of energy, or a quieter but longer duration sound. And then they have some grunts. 
And the females use the grunts. We think of grunts as being like um, aggressive. But um, they're used also in primates. They're used uh, um, there's just communicatively generally. So um, can be very friendly. Uh, communication with offspring during post-hatching maternal care. You will watch a video about that. Um, and they're of short duration, sort of like I just did, one-tenth of a second. Uh, um, and low fundamental frequency of 100 hertz, and that's about... Mm, so... Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and that that's it's funny because that's almost exactly the same as the grunt produced by the midshipman fish. Uh, the pre-hatching calls. So these are produced from the egg, from the offspring... Like I said, you'll see a video in the caiman of the um, babies doing that. Um, and then uh, these sounds are linear descending frequency modulation. So frequency modulation, again, just means the frequency is modulated, is changed. So oh, <laughs> something like that with a fundamental frequency around 500 hertz. So that's a little bit above A440. Um, and then with harmonics, uh, that should say not... 300 hertz, 3,000 hertz, I guess. So that would be 500, 1,000. So that would be the sixth harmonic. Um, and duration of 200 milliseconds, so very short. So one-fifth of a second. <laughs> um, and then this helps them. Why do they do these things? It helps them synchronize their hatching. And um, it helps them stimulate their mother to come uncover the eggs when they're ready to come out. Uh, and then um, the calls intensify after hatching. So the young learn how to call from the egg, but then they're still using those calls once they're born. Um, and then it intensifies in various ways. So like the duration gets longer, they get louder, the frequency height grows, the bandwidth, like the, 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 yeah, the amount of frequency covered um, increases, and the amount of modulation. So if it was like, at first, it might be like, or if it's multiple things. Okay. And now for some questions and answers. Conclusions. What is a reptile? Reptile is a category that does not correspond precisely to a scientifically defined clade. Clades are based on ancestry. Birds, dinosaurs, and crocodiles are all more closely related to one another than they are to other quote-unquote reptiles. Therefore, the term reptile must either a include birds or b exclude crocodiles and dinosaurs um so like i said we'll still use reptile in that term in the normal way but you should know that birds are technically reptiles when we talk about birds we'll talk about them as if they are reptiles okay how common is vocalization in reptiles um all the reptile groups that we looked at vocalize in some way um, with turtles, we saw it was only one-third of them, and I don't know what the percentage is for the other ones. I think the crocodilians vocalize a lot. But um, it's at least, you know, in all the main groups, like some of the species vocalize. So that's important. And we saw a similar thing with frogs, too. Um, all the reptile groups vocalize in some way in both sexes. So that's much more, we're seeing that much more with reptiles than um, with amphibians, as far as I can tell. And the young vocalize too, and I don't think we saw that in either fish or amphibians. So that might be a new thing. The biggest exception here is the snake. Snake has no larynx, um, but it still uses hissing to communicate. So um, it's not producing tonal sounds, but it's still using air and passing air through its throat and creating a little constriction to produce a, a hiss. And that hiss is used for communication, but notably is not used for courtship, right? Almost all animals that we've seen so far produce a sound for courtship, and then they might also produce one for defensiveness. But this is, I think this is the first animal we've seen that produces sounds for defense, but not courtship. Um, okay, what types of sounds are made by reptiles? Um, tones, hisses, grunts, bellows. Um, what functions do vocalizations have in reptiles? Courtship, right? Territoriality, uh, and that's, you know, territoriality and defense seem similar, but defense, we defined it in with amphibians, that was more about defending yourself against other species, whereas territoriality might be more communication within your species, or territoriality could be more like male, male communication, um, where, yeah, uh, whereas def 
defense. Yeah, protecting your eggs, say, from a, a predator. I mean, the predator might even be of your own species. Okay. And then mother-infant communication. This is new. Uh, we haven't seen... We've seen that both males and females can take care of their young in amphibians and fish, but we haven't seen vocal communication between them, and certainly we haven't seen it in the offspring. So both pre- and post-hatching, at least some reptiles, the infants are communicating with the mothers, and the mothers communicating back, and those communications influence the other one's behaviors. Okay, that is all we have. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and...